And now, a word from Infirmary Media. Hey dudes and dudettes, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Be Kind and Rewind podcast, a podcast chock full of everything nostalgic about the 80s, 90s, and more, where we chat with our favorite celebrities about nostalgic VHS days. I'm your host, Carlos, and this episode, I'm joined by the man who's been a comedic puppeteer for a majority of his life through theater, one-man shows, and political satire. We've also watched him as one of our favorite educational characters on TV as Beekman on Beekman's World. So I welcome actor, writer, producer, filmmaker, and puppeteer Paul Zaloom to the podcast. Well, thank you. You are welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's an honor to have you on today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. I see you're very busy. Uh, so you're about to make an appearance out in Comic-Con down in Mexico. Is that correct? Yeah, it's called La Mole. La Mole, and, yeah. Yeah, and it's. I think it's a fan con of some kind. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I haven't, I haven't done it before, but... Uh, yeah, it's in Mexico City, and uh, yeah, I'm doing a couple of shows and then meets and greets. And so you've done a lot, a lot of Comic-Cons, it seems like. Is that your uh, a go-to for you? I, uh, I've done a few of them. I did the Dragon Con in uh, Atlanta. That's the only one I think I've done in the States. I've done a couple of furry conventions that were total gas. <laughs> it sounds uh, like it. Yeah, those people are nuts, man. I just I had such a good time. They're just crazy partiers and just really uh, eccentric and wild. And the Dragon Con thing was really fun. I ended up doing my puppet show and a Beekman show and a ventriloquist act and all kinds of crap for that one. But well, in Mexico, I do a lot like uh, Campus Party and Talent Network. And those are, those are more like tech kind of conventions about entrepreneurial stuff and also about coding and hacking very sort of computer and internet based conventions a lot of college students showing well, up well it those. seems like Be the beekman character is huge in latin america like they yes. just they they blow up every time they see you coming out come into town yeah it's completely off the hook i it's unbelievable uh there's just something about that guy with the hair and the green lab coat making direct address, you know, to the kids looking at the camera, very close to the camera, something about that, that appeals to that Latin sensibility. And I, I just think there's a big, strong emotional connection that people made with a character. Yeah, I mean, you locked me in as a as a Latin American kid, and so I I definitely enjoyed you know like you said having that personal touch you know breaking the fourth wall as they would say you know talking directly to the audience and so yeah maybe some of those out there who maybe didn't have you know maybe you know parents or so or any sort of guidance that they were looking for maybe you were that guidance so they're thanking you in tenfold at this point in time. Yeah, I think there were a lot of latchkey kids, so they'd get home from school. Maybe the folks weren't weren't home, or maybe they were. But anyway. You know, they'd watch the show and kids don't make a big distinction between a face on the TV and a face in the room. Uh, you know, it's just all people to them. And uh, the fact that I was so close to the camera and I looked them right in the eyes, you know, that that makes a very powerful emotional connection, which yeah, I had no idea of. <laughs> so trust. when did you when did you start finding out that, you know, Beekman, the Beekman character is huge down there? Well, when I went to Brazil. The first time, and there was a press conference, it was for a, a, a publisher's convention, and there, were, there was a lot of press interest, and I thought that was really interesting. I did a lot of interviews and stuff, but it was the second time I went to Brazil when there was a couple of thousand people in the audience, and they were body surfing some woman who had passed out at the audience, and people were just going crazy. That was when I had my first inkling, and then the first time I went to Mexico, they booked me in an 800-seat theater. And then they and it was just one show. And then they said, oh, we want to add another show. And then they said, oh, we want to add a third show. But <clears throat> we want to do it outdoors. So I ended up playing for like 18,000 people in three oh, shows. Oh, man. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Rock star status right there. Huge stage. And yeah, it was just like <laughs> very surreal. So I come home and I'm, you know, back to being nobody, which <clears throat> 
suits me fine. You know, because I wore a wig and a hat. I uh, a hat. I didn't wear a hat. A wig and um, well, a wig. Uh, you know, you you don't recognize me on the street necessarily because I just look completely transformed. And plus, I'm a lot older now. True. I mean, then don't say you're not a nobody here. You got fan. You got plenty of Beekman fans out here. Who, uh, <laughs> people, people. As soon as I announced that we we're going to be chatting, you know, my Twitter blew up. People were just they're ecstatic. I love that show. I watch that every Saturday morning. So they're definitely maybe in the woodworks, but they're out there. Oh, uh, that's cool. I'm, I'm always happy to hear that. That's nice. So yeah. So we'll we'll get into more Beekman stuff here in a little bit. But I kind of want to just kind of start off with a little bit of your early life stuff. You know, kind of kind of seems like you've been a puppeteer like your whole life. But there had to have been a point beforehand that you weren't a puppeteer and that you got inspired to do this kind of stuff and puppeteering and acting. So was there a specific like, you know, performance or anything that really got you inspired into getting to this performance art? Well, I'd always been interested in. Um, like I, I, when I was little, I loved stuffed animals and there were puppets in the toy store that I always sort of admired from a distance and was curious about, but I don't think I ever had any, I, I, we did, we had a couple of like Stife, um, hand puppets, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess kind of pegs my social economic class right there because they're beautiful wool handmade German toys and I grew up with them and they were just they're just gorgeous, beautiful things and super collectible now. And anyway, I liked I like the puppets, but I, I uh, and I did the school play and all of that when I was a kid. Uh, I was a total ham bone and uh, got cast in the school play. And then when I went to college, the Bread and Puppet Theater was in residence there, uh, sort of renowned avant garde. Uh, radical puppet theater and I ended up picking a couple of workshops over there and the next thing I knew they invited me to be in the company so and I was 19 so that that you know and that I, I was off to the races that was it for me puppets so yeah, pretty young age you got into it. So with the Bread and Puppet Theater, I kind of read up a little bit about them. So I, I saw that, uh, like you talked about, they're a political radical uh, puppet theater, but they also uh, serve bread and aioli, aioli during the uh, during each performance to, to kind of get that sense of community. Does that still happen? Yeah, um, yeah. Peter, uh, the director, Peter Schumann, uh, artistic director, founder of the theater with his wife Elka. He's a baker, um, and he makes bread out of uh, – it's a rye bread, and it's similar to the bread that he survived on during the Second World War. And many people in, in Germany did, you know, very basic peasant bread, hand-ground, sourdough handed down for many, many years. His goes back to the 40s, I think, from his mom. And that when they were refugees, like escaping the Germans – they would glean individual grains of rye from the fields and then communally bake. And so that's how they survived. It's very nutritious bread. You know, it's, I mean, you can imagine a rye grain that's hand ground uh, with sourdough. It's pretty, pretty hearty. Got to have good teeth. Sounds, sounds like it. Yeah, I got some good chompers. So his thing was theater should be as basic and nutritious as bread, not the crap bread we, you know, Wonder Bread, but like real bread. All the sugar-filled so, bread and everything we got over here. Yeah. Right, right. So that was, you know, that was how that came about. And then, you know, giving bread, it's it's obviously got resonance with the whole um, sacrament in, in the Christian church and uh, all of that. And plus, it's just nice to give people bread. And the aioli, you know, it's got a, a ton of garlic in it, make them all stinky and send them happy and smelly. No, no, I, I, uh, I'm all for it. I'm all for the, uh, the bread and everything. So I like the sense of community. So what kind of shows were you part of? Like you, you guys were creating your own, you know, puppets from like from scratch and, and creating shows out of that. Yeah. He's kind of a neo German expressionist, uh, uh, sculptor and painter. He was trained as a dancer and a sculptor. Uh, so we put the two together, dancing sculptures, puppets, and so that's his uh, that's his shtick, and and um, very much influenced by the German expressionists and the new objectivity uh, movement in Germany from like you know 1910 to uh, the Second World War. But artists like Emil Nolde or um, 
uh, Beckman, Max Beckman, and um, Otto Dix, George Gross, a, a school of art, which I am a gigantic fan of myself, in fact. Well, cool, cool. And then I also read out that you're uh, making it a, a family thing. Is it uh, your daughters were a part of it now doing some of the uh, some of the touring? Is that right? Well, no, she never went on tour, but she was the, I was the ringmaster of this giant puppet circus that we used to do every summer. Oh, okay. And we continue to do, but on a smaller scale. And I go back every year and work on that. Um, but she I was the announcer. And then for a few years, she helped me. Uh, announce we did it together and then my granddaughters uh have been in the show too it's generational now you, you, you got a legacy going on now at the bread and puppet theater yeah I, when i was when i was a skinny ass hippie fool and age 19 i never would have imagined that i'd be one the first of three generations that would be in shows there so i, I i've been very lucky you know kind of made it puppetry is really interesting because you get to play all the parts you get to write the thing it's not like being an actor where you're kind of a cog in a big machine. Uh, mm -hmm. When you're a puppeteer, you're like the whole machine. And um, and that really appealed to my megalomaniacal, um, massive uh, ego, throbbing uh, insanity. Well, then that, that meant you had to go solo at some point, right? So that's why it led you to your one-man shows that you started developing. Uh, you did like over over 11 of them. Is that right? Or more more than that? I think I counted them, and I think there's 15 or 16. I don't remember. Uh, but, yeah, I just – there just weren't enough jokes. You know, Peter's shows are pretty lyrical, and, and it's really like an artist theater. And he's got jokes. He's got a sense of humor. But I'm, I'm just, like, down with the humor. That's my shtick. So I just wanted to make stuff that was more crass and more, like, American in its sensibility. Um, and I was inspired by him – he used like a chair as a puppet in the show. And, and, you know, I grew up loving art and loving Klaus Oldenburg and uh, the sculptor and just sort of descended from the whole Marcel Duchamp found object thing. And so first shows I did, I just took junk and trash and garbage and objects and toys and tools and appliances and jiggled the crap around as puppets and environments that satirized all kinds of stuff. It's just a creation process of just taking something, an inanimate object, and turning a whole show into that around it. So, what is that creative process like? Do you do you already have an idea coming in with an object, or is this something as soon as you see the right tool or the right toy, you start creating around that? Uh, it's really kind of ass backwards. I mean, I can't tell you from like day one how it worked because I don't remember. I'm usually when you're creating stuff like this, you're not recording it in your head because you're totally present. So you don't, I don't remember. i never remember. I have an artistic partner, Lynn Jeffries, and she is paying attention, fortunately. And so she knows the answers to a lot of these questions. Um, <clears throat> but we're working on a show now. We're taking a hiatus for way too long, but we're working on a show because I wanted to get back into the found objects because I like it so much. I just, I, I just love, like uh, we're doing a show about me going to Mars and just because I think this whole thing of going to Mars is completely idiotic, but also very amusing. Um, so what we did was we just went in the garage and I have like tons and tons of objects and toys and tools and packaging to all kinds of crap in boxes. And we just take it out and I would hold something up and I'd say, OK, what's this? And we would just jam on like what that object is. So um, what's a good example? You know, if I had a little, um, uh, I, I don't know what a good example is. We'll say like a, a lamp, possibly. Uh, yeah, a lamp. Well, the gimmick with the lamp is, okay, you plug it in, the lamp gets an idea, you turn it on, you know, boom. Uh, that's a gimmick. Uh, or the light goes off. You know, you take an object and you say, what can this thing do? So with a it's lamp, just a, a flood of brainstorming, basically, yeah. right there. See what you know, what it's capable of, what it could be capable of. It's and it's quite methodical. It's you know, as stupid and crazy as it sounds, it's there's actually a method to the madness, in terms of just taking an object. Let's say a stapler, for example. I have a gorgeous stapler, that's gold. That uh, is gorgeous. Yeah, string line <laughs> gold stapler, and so. If I was to say, okay, what the hell am I going to do with this thing? Well, what you ask yourself, what does a staple do? It combines things. It puts things together. 
but it's also bureaucratic. Uh, it's kind of a punishing thing. It's like a rifle shot. You know, it's a clamping thing. And this one's gold. So maybe if I had like a regular one that was gray, what's the gray one? What's the gold one? Is the gray one the, the you know, the worker and the gold one the boss? Or is the gold one the rich one and the gray one? You know what I mean? So you just... It's this sort of methodical process of just trying to extract every possible innuendo or uh, meaning or gag or joke, because I'm always looking for the joke. It's like any comedian, you know, we're always looking for jokes. We're just trained that way. We're always looking for shit that's funny. <laughs> exactly. You got to find that that other angle to, to everything. No, it's totally understandable. And so, yeah, that kind of gives a little insight, you know, like you said, just taking a stapler and then, you know, you create from there. Um, and then also you talked about your more recent one. So you're going to you're creating one where you guys are going to Mars. Is that one in the works? Do you, do you have any idea maybe when it'll be done or when you're looking to get it out? Uh, I would say in probably a little bit more than a year, and I don't think I'm going to take it on the road. I think I'm going to want to make videos because it's in it's it's kind of on a scale of toy theater. Uh, I have this current show that I've been touring called White Like Me, a Hunky Dory Puppet Show, which is where I u- I use a toy theater. A toy theater is like a miniature proscenium theater with a front curtain, you know, that goes up and down, and so I perform in that thing but it's so small we need to video project it so the audience can see what the hell's going on and i just love the curtain the curtain's like the best thing in the theater the curtain going up and down it's always the best part of the show (laughs) it's like wow the curtain went up that's so cool it's all downhill from there but so i want to i want to do it in the context of toy theater and i want to shoot it because uh my my carbon footprint of traveling around to do these shows is like heinous. And uh, it's just so interesting to me to do toy theater and to shoot it. Because we did a, a toy theater movie, um, Dante's Inferno, uh, was a feature-length toy theater thing. That wasn't found object. That was paper puppets based on uh, Sandow Burke's work. Um, yeah, I saw the I saw the trailer for that one. I, well, I wanted to talk about that one too. So yeah, that was one that you like co-wrote and you kind of helped create that one as well. Um, I definitely like that one because it's like when people think of puppets, they think of like the Jim Henson puppets, things like that. But these are like essentially cardboard cutouts that you guys are using like this amazing cinematography and lighting to like you know kind of capture this dramatic story that you kind of it's a good a, a nice creative angle so, uh, for Dante's Inferno. It was it was fun. The figures were about six inches tall, and uh, Sandow Burke and uh, Elise Pignolet, his his artistic partner and wife, they made over five hundred puppets for that movie, and it was a, a feature length film. And we just took Dante's Inferno and put it into L.A. and you know contemporary California, America, Las Vegas, whatever. And just translated all the things that Dante uh, was shown by Virgil in the Inferno into contemporary America. So it was a great vehicle for doing political satire, social satire. It was, and uh, yeah, from, just from watching the trailer, you know, I I definitely want to check out the the full length. So you, you got my attention with that one. Um, and then the other one you did too was the In Smog and Thunder. Uh, the Great War of California. So that one was a little bit different. More of just it was more of a um, kind of was just a, a plates. So it was a, kind, of, kind of like a sketch plates. Or I, I guess you can describe it. Uh, yeah, that was we. I uh, I did that with Sandow Burke uh, prior to um, doing the Dante's thing, and and uh, we worked with the director uh, Sean Meredith. Um, and basically what happened was Sean just scanned all these paintings and then we showed the paintings and made a narration that went along with the paintings. And based what, the, what the conceit was Sandow Burke is a, uh, he's a figurative painter based here in, in Long Beach. And he does a lot of different, really interesting work. He's a really amazing painter. Um, and he had done a fictional war between San Francisco and L.A. happening in contemporary times. And, and he got inspired to do this because he has a, a gallery up in San Francisco, Catherine Clark. 
And he would go up there for an opening, and afterwards he'd go out with some local artists, and they'd go to a bar and have drinks. And they'd say, so, you know, where are you from? And he'd say, oh, I'm from L.A. And then they would go off, you know, how they do up there in San Francisco. You know, they just have this inferiority complex, and they have to, like, wail and moan about how much L.A. sucks because they're just, you know, it's the ant and the elephant. And uh, I love San Francisco. It's a great place to visit. I mean, I don't know who the hell would want to live there, but it's (laughs) – you, know, you gotta be nuts. If you can afford it, yeah. yeah. If you can ever afford it, yeah, try it. Uh, no, it's a great town. There's a lot of great people, and I really do love it there. But, you know, so there's this rivalry, and he thought, oh, I'm going to do something about this. So he made this fictional war between these two cities, and it was a way to send up a lot of cultural archetypes and a lot of cliches and just to use as a, a means to make political and social satire. So what happened was he said he was going to combine – there were like three elements to the show. It was a big-ass show. It had sculptures and, you know, these giant paintings. And he said, oh, let's do an audio tour for the Laguna Art Museum. Um, And I said, yeah, let's do it. And they were not – they weren't into it. But we did a test recording for five minutes, and they went crazy. And so we did the audio tour. They put it in the catalog. They actually made a CD and put it in the catalog. And then he said, let's make a film. So that's what we did. And it was a hell of a lot of fun. So where can we find these, uh, the full length versions of these? Are these on your website or these for purchase or anywhere or streaming? Yeah, you know, I really don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You you could build the anticipation and say they're coming out, the re-release coming out, remastered, Uh, the George Lucas version. I know, it's so lame. when When I was young, I was all over the publicity and all over that stuff. But the older I get and with the internet, I just want to crawl in a hole and hide because it's just, it's just the internet is like being naked. It's just like those dreams you have where you have no clothes and you're in the middle of the mall and you have a heart on, you're standing there. It's like, what the hell am I doing? That's what the internet feels like to me. (laughs) Very vulnerable. Yes. So I, yeah. And I'm just not, I'm not as entrepreneurial as I used to be. So th- I think in Smog and Thunder, there are physical CDs around, and I have a bunch of them. Uh, but I, I actually don't know how you how you get a hold of it. And the same with Dante. And Dante was on Netflix for a while, but I know it's totally lame. Well, we might have to go uh, search in the deep web. If not, I might have to obtain a, a, a copy of each from you somehow, some way. Right on. Just because I, because I'm, I'm super interested in checking them out. So we may have to uh, deal with that off air. Okay. And so the next thing after the uh, Bread and Puppet Theater, uh, you went to sketch comedy. Uh, you did the uh, the Unnaturals. Is that correct? Uh, 1989. Uh, I don't know what that is. Was that a TV thing? It was the yeah the sketch comedy group the uh, oh. the Unnaturals. Oh. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe I uh, was misinformed with the information. It says you were there with Tim Blake Nelson. Right. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Uh, it was a TV thing, right? Yeah, it was with, um, I think, CCTV right before it became Comedy Central. Right. Kind of one of those. Uh... I should write this down and do some research. About this. <laughs> uh, because I, I vaguely remember that. Yeah. Um, it was probably a short run because it wasn't too long before you moved on to Beekman's World. Right. I mean, I also did a pilot with Jim Henson for something I think it was called Inner Tube, where I did some of my found objects for that thing. And that that never panned out. It didn't get picked up. I did. A, I also did a kids show pilot, I think, with uh, um, the local PBS station in New York with Fred Newman, the guy that does the sound effects on that um on the, the show on um, National Public Radio. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway. So, yeah, I had a, I had a few of those run, <laughs> one-off. Uh, so I'm re- re- rekindling a little, some memories in there for you uh, about the, the, the unnaturals. Yeah, and we also had – I had a uh, – I was in a comedy group with three other people called the Oddvark. And that's what we I was living in Vermont, and we it motivated, motivated us to move to New York to try to uh, – you know, become rich and famous or whatever. And so we, we were an improv comedy group. We didn't take suggestions. We just improvised the acts and the audience didn't know it. They had no idea we were improvising. So it's like the worst idea in, in the history of theater to like improvise without telling the audience. Cause the whole benefit of, of 
improvisation is the audience is like, wow, they made that up on the spot. But to make it up on the spot and not tell the audience is like, wow, this sucks. Why, why didn't these guys like write something better? <laughs> so idiotic. <laughs> hey, you got to try, you got to try new things here and there. So, but well, like we said, it wasn't long though. You, when you, before, while you're doing all that, you moved on to Beekman's world in 1992. <laughs> Uh, we ran for four seasons every Saturday morning, tuning in uh, to watch Beekman give us the, all the scientific and, and you know environmental facts that we can take. So at what point did you get involved with that show when it was during his creation? Well, the guy who directed the show, uh, a guy named Jay Dubin, uh, is a New Yorker uh, guy who had I had met through the old school Quaker Jewish communist summer camp network, which exists on the East Coast. And he uh, he and I tried to pitch something to HBO with the found objects, and that didn't fly. But then years later, when he got the job to do this Beekman's World thing, uh, he reached out to me, and um, I sent them a, a video of me playing a food engineer with, like, a lab coat and a chef's toque. And it was about all the disgusting crap that's in food chemicals that blow up and storage and, you know, wood that they put in food and, um, you know, the amount. So you're like a Netflix documentary before Netflix, basically. It, yeah, it was, uh, it was a fun show. I just took, I, I photographed documents from, uh, food processing brochures and, um, and then just, you know, read them, read the stuff. It was disgusting. And, and it was quite funny <laughs> because they wrote the material. All I had to do was, photograph it and read it and it was hilarious so it was great they wrote all the jokes so anyway the the Beekman's world was based on a comic that was written on the uh on mac it was the first one that was written on a mac uh and it was syndicated in 300 plus newspapers and it was the conceit was uh kids would write into this scientist and the scientist Beekman would answer the kids questions on um in the comic uh, every week or every day. I don't even know how, how often it ran. Were the penguins part of the comic as well? No. <laughs> well, there was an addition? Yes, they were indeed. So I, I Don and uh, uh, Herb and Don, I, I guess Don was the name after Mr. Wizard. Is that correct? Uh, well, both of them, because Mr. Wizard was named Don, uh, Don Herbert. So yeah, that was a tribute to them. And, uh, and the, uh, Mark Ritz, who played Lester the Rat, he and I are both puppeteers. I mean, he came, his family was uh, a company of puppeteers, the Ritz family puppets, where they performed on um, The Tonight Show and all kinds of stuff. So he was oh, hired cool. to do a rat puppet on the show. And Jay said, oh, what do we need a puppet for? It's just you're going to cut to this, like, fur ball, and it's just going to do verbal jokes. And that's lame. If we have a human in a rat suit, he'll be able to hold stuff and do things, and we'll be able to use him actively instead of just cutting to him. So he thought he was hired as a puppeteer, and he shows up, and it's like, no, you're in a suit. <laughs> shows up in sweatpants and T-shirts, like, actually, we're going to need you to get in the costume today. Yeah, and he was great. He was he was amazing. Uh, oh yeah, definitely enjoyed Lester. He always added a little extra fun to every episode. Yeah, an amazing performer and a beautiful um, and wonderful human being whom I adored uh, and just loved so much. Such a great guy. I, unfortunately, Mark died of cancer uh, about eight years ago. And oh, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, and and I I miss him all the time. Uh, he was just a wonderful, warm, funny human being, super duper smart. He went to Harvard University, and uh, he knew a lot of stuff. He's just a really interesting cat, and I'm still close to his kids and his ex-wife, and um, yeah, I think about him all the time. He was just an amazing human. Well, his memory lives on, you know, through puppeteering or through, you know, Beekman Squirrel, so definitely positive vibes for, for him and his family. Uh, so for the show, like in regards to the scientific facts and all the environmental stuff, where did all that stuff come from? Who would come up with, like, what's, what you were going to talk about on the show? 
Well, in the beginning, we didn't have questions uh, because what you can see to the show was the kids would write in. There was an address shown on the screen and and the kids would write in and then we would use their questions to, uh, you know, to get the topics for the show. So it was a three act thing and t- the two bookend acts were answering the questions and then the middle section was like a rapid fire factoid thing and whatever. Um so that's we really did get the ideas from the kids writing in and asking the questions. And we covered a lot of, of it's sort of basic uh, science stuff that you would think of kids writing in, you know, why is the sky blue? Or um, they would ask questions about uh, animals or, you know, and we had tons of animals on the show. And we demonstrated different physical principles and all kinds of stuff. Any any off the wall letters you get from kids? You're like, I don't even know how we could even answer this one. Uh, well, they did ask. Uh, some kids asked about farting, and we wanted to do farting for a long time, but the <laughs> network was like, "No, you can't do that." But they finally let us do uh, farting. Hey, it's it's all about uh, you know changes are coming. The networks need to see it. So, so farting is the, if that's the start of it, then that's the start of it. Yeah. Yeah, and kids are interested in bodily functions, and I mean they're fascinated by it. So that's a good avenue to get into science with them. You know, um, you take their their worst instincts and turn it into an educated opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised it didn't catch on more. Like you guys weren't like part of like the education curriculum because I felt like I learned more by the visuals that you guys presented than you know sitting in a classroom looking at a book. So it's just kind of like that interactive visual type of learning that I felt I learned more and I'm surprised it didn't catch on or you guys weren't like, you know, presented with, hey, maybe you could be part of a school's curriculum somehow. Well, a lot of teachers would show the videos when they, you know, go out for a cigarette or something. They throw on a tape. <laughs> <laughs> they wheel, wheel in the VCR and the uh, TV. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, a lot of teachers have told me that and kids tell, have told me, oh, yeah, you know, teacher used to show your show all the time. Um, we figured, you know, we were partners with, uh, teachers and parents, schools with librarians, you know, we're just part of the picture. Um, I mean, you know, school is going to be dry sometimes and it's going to be just, you know, you got to do the heavy lifting and we just came at it from a different direction. So I think it's part of this constellation of ways that we all can learn stuff. And what's, no, definitely, definitely. What's interesting is over 50% of the audience in the States was adults. And, you know, adults are getting up at like 730 in the morning on a Saturday to watch a show. And I didn't understand why until a friend of mine said, uh, oh, yeah, I watch a show because I know I'm going to understand the science because it's a kid show. So you have this subject that people see as being inscrutable and really difficult. And because it was written for kids, adults who were science reluctant or afraid would watch the show because they knew, oh, you know, for kids, I'm going to get it. It was nice, a nice option on Saturday mornings. And, you know, like you said, older adults were watching it, getting their kids up to watch it. They're enjoying science in the morning. So I'm sure, like you said, just getting getting the a variety of fans, you know, adults through kids who have enjoyed the show throughout the years. Um, so another thing to talk about Saturday mornings, another one that we, we also enjoyed on Saturdays was Bill Nye, the science guy. And I know you guys had a little bit of beef in the past before, or at least he's mentioned things about you in the press. So you guys had a chance to squash that at all or speak? with each other i have done uh i've met him one time um in a hotel lobby i think and we did science friday together once um i don't know if you're referring to him he he said a couple of times that he was a real scientist and i was just a performance artist or an actor or whatever uh Mm -hmm. i've never i i I never really responded to that. I'm, I have no beef with that guy. I think it's more recess beef. Like us kids on the recess were like, oh, man, Bill Bill Nye versus Beekman. Like what would happen? Who would win? It's one of those kind of, I think, us kids created it more than like it actually happens type of situation. Yeah. That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We probably had more influence on the rumors and everything than than what actually unfolded. But yeah, it was always kind of a, a mystery of always just like, you know, putting you two together, the two science guys together. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of people viewed it as a as a, uh, a rivalry. And I just don't care about stuff like that. Life's too short. Who cares? 
Yeah, of course, of course. You know, it's like when people talk about Marvel versus DC, it's like none of it matters. Everyone's having a good time. We're all being entertained. Let's enjoy it. So, yeah, I agree. We should always just approach it that way. So maybe one day we'll see you guys on a on a show together working, doing some science projects together soon. So we'll see. Um, But uh, last few things here uh, about uh, Fort Beekman's world is uh, we actually have some fan questions. Some people from Twitter have have reached out. They want to ask you a few questions uh, before we get to the last part of the podcast here. Uh, So getting into the the Twitter questions, the first one is from Retro 80s Trivia, and their question is about the Penguins. Were Herb and Don hard to work with? (laughs) Uh, Well, I actually, when we shot their stuff, that was all shot in like – in a group so in other words we would once we got rolling um they would try to have five six seven eight episodes written at a time and then take the episodes and chop them up into what location it takes place so if if there's um art burns the cook and we're in the kitchen i need to be in a costume they would break those out and we would shoot all of them for a few episodes so same with the penguins and actually mark ritz who played lester the rat he operated one of the penguins he manipulated because like i said he's a puppeteer i could have done the other one but i was in like 90 percent of the shots already and when the penguins shot that would be a time for me to go home or just you know, go to my dressing room, which I almost never did because it was never time to go to the dressing room because uh, I was in so many shots, you know, it was, we'd just eat on the set and all the rest of it. Uh, and the guys that did the the um, the Penguin voices were two, uh, this partnership of two guys that did voiceovers that were super famous for it. And they were the, the by far the richest people that worked on the show. So the guys who did the voices, one guy had a Rolls Royce. He used to show up in a Rolls Royce. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was wild. This is Rolls Royce in his sweatpants to do some voiceover. Yeah. I, I believe I met them at one point, but that, you know, they would just go in the studio somewhere, not even, probably not even on the lot and, and record their stuff. And then they would, lip set the puppets to it well it looks like herb and don were high maintenance <laughs> yeah uh, at least the puppets were <laughs> you know it sounds like they uh, uh they, they 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 needed some extra screen time uh to get everything going so no that's uh, that's awesome uh and now we got joseph boyley at says uh, that's awesome love that show when will he do a netflix show or battle bill nye uh yeah uh, i mean i've been approached by people with that question or with proposals but I think that show cost a lot of money back in the day because they you know they spent a lot of money on kids shows back in the day so the budget was like a couple hundred grand I think for each show and you're not going to see that in TV today they don't spend that kind of dough on kids shows Um, and they don't do educational program very much these days anyway Uh, so I don't think it's going to come back. Uh, and if it did, I would think my inclination would be do something really radically different because otherwise you're just going to compare the old show to the new show and it's probably not going to be a very positive comparison. So I think it'd be cool to do with puppets, just have stupid puppets and do stuff like that. I think that would be fun. That would be. That would be great. I mean, you, you've been doing it your whole life. You just combine the two arts. I think that, that could be something uh, that you're on to. So maybe we'll see that happening. Maybe not on Netflix, maybe on YouTube, maybe on some other streaming service. Who knows? So we'll hopefully we'll see that before too long. Uh, the next one we have is from Trini Sage that says, Why did the assistant girls change so often? Well, the first one, Alana Ubach, uh, she was in the first 26, I think. Uh, episodes and she made a decision to move on and do other stuff which was uh, a shame because she was really great and uh, I think it would have been great for her to stick with the show for the duration but you know it was a career choice for her and then uh, Eliza Schneider was on the show for a while and then um, uh, and then we had um, Santa Moses uh, play. So it was a decision by the, by the CBS executives that uh, they wanted a change to happen between those, those two incarnations. 
Yeah, it's another one of those pre-Google recess like speculation. Like, what happened? Why? Why did they change this out? Why is this changing? So, you know, it's just like, what? What? What happened? And now, you know, it's good to it's good to know. But of course, you know, it's new, normally up higher up type of decision is usually what it is. Yeah, and not not uh, necessarily well informed or smart decisions. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, last one we have here is uh, Daniel Sun eighteen. It says, "Absolutely love this show." My question is: Out of all the facts on the show, what's the most memorable fact that stood out to you that you still remember today? Uh, huh. Well, I, I guess the most obvious one is the one I mentioned before, which is why is the sky blue? Um, and I, I found that really interesting, and it's because the light. The blue light, the blue part of the spectrum bounces off dust and moisture particles in the atmosphere, and that bouncing blue light makes the sky blue. And I thought that was interesting. So- well, there it is. Yeah. We, we just got our fact right on the show here. I'm, I'm honored. So, yeah, no, it's awesome. Uh, I, as a kid, that was always like the most common question. Why is the sky blue? And right. the teachers would always kind of give their own personal answers because, of course, there's, <laughs> there's no real answer, at least at that point in time they knew. So, yeah, it's good to actually know what it actually is, why it's making it blue. Yep. Everyone, thanks for the Twitter shout outs. That's all the questions that we had uh, from our fans. Now, last thing I just want to wrap up for the podcast is going to talk about uh, some of the current projects that you have going on. Seems like you're, you know, performing all over the world. And also you're doing your uh, classes and workshops as well. So what are some other uh, projects you got coming up? Well, um, I mentioned the the Mars thing, the Mars project. We're, and we're going to we're still casting. We're still just pulling stuff out of boxes and the cast tells us what the story is going to be, which is sort of ass backwards. Usually you have a story and then, you know, you figure out who the characters are. But here we just all this stuff is kind of telling us which way to go. So when Lynn is available again in the in the fall, we're going to bust all that crap out in the garage and just go full steam ahead with that. Um, I'm writing a new Beekman stage show uh, that's an adaptation of an earlier one that I had about the brain. Uh, cause I'm really interested in neuroscience and, uh, I just actually am in the middle of writing a shtick where I use audience volunteers to replicate a, an experiment that was done with mice and their, their, uh, gut microbiome. Oh, uh, so you're going to uh, get, are they running through a little maze trying to get to the cheese? Uh, we're actually going to cut them open with a big knife and blood's going to come spurting out. So, Beautiful. um, yeah, the gag with the blood is um, – it's like, I don't know, 20 or 30 feet of red silk and, you know, silk compacts. So it's a, it goes into the, 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 mice's, the mouse's stomach and I pull the red fabric out <laughs> and, um, and it's, you know, blood all over the place. So I, we'll have to see if it works or not. Well, cool, cool. So, yeah, so we have those projects, and then hopefully maybe one day we'll see re- remastered versions of Dante's Inferno uh, out there on the streaming or somewhere else. Yeah, we we actually have a subtitled version in Spanish, too, and it would be great to find a platform. I mean, I'd just like to have it out there and play these things on the Internet, but um, uh, you're motivating me. I'll have to bring this up with, with our my artistic partners and see if we can figure something out. Well, perfect. Well, I'll, I'll have to stay in the loop, so maybe I get myself a copy before too long. So I would appreciate that. But other than that, you know, uh, Paul, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today and being an awesome guest. Uh, let the listeners know uh, where they can follow you on social media so they can keep updated on all your projects, things that are coming up. Gee, well, I I, I have a, a lame website, um, which is BeekmanLive.com. And uh, then there's uh, Zaloom.com. Uh, where uh, there's stuff on their videos and links and stuff like that. Um, and then there's a Facebook page, but that's mainly in Spanish and Portuguese, and it's kind of called El Mundo de Beekman. And there's, <laughs> uh, there's like a, a, a three quarters of a million followers or whatever on there. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. But I'm, I'm lame at the social media stuff. I'm sorry. I'm just like, I'm not good at it. 
Well, it sounds like you got enough fans out there who are taking care of it for you, basically, so you don't have to worry about that side of it. So sure. well, we'll get all that plugged there in the description so everyone can kind of go check out the websites, find you online, and start following along so they can see, you know, maybe uh, maybe Beekman might be showing up at a, uh, a Comic-Con before too long uh, near somebody. I sure hope so. It's a possibility. So, yeah. So, well, thank you again, Paul. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everyone else, for tuning into this episode of the Be Kind and Rewind podcast. Subscribe and rate us on all podcast apps, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Infirmary Media Podcast Network. Also, follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Be Kind Rewind Pod for all of your nostalgic needs. So, thanks and be excellent to each other. Infirmary Media.